7.36 on LBC. Um, we are interviewing all of the different political leaders in Scotland in advance of the Scottish Parliament elections next Thursday. Uh, we've heard from All for Unity, we've heard from ALBA, or... I can never remember how Alex Salmon told me I had to pronounce it. Alipa, that's the one. Um, and we are going to be hearing from the Liberal Democrats tomorrow and the Conservatives and the SNP next week. But we are delighted to welcome Anna Sawa onto the programme. He's leader of the Scottish Labour Party. Anna, it's very good evening to you. Um, I always think being leader of the Scottish Labour Party is one of the most difficult jobs in British politics. Why on earth did you want it? One of the most difficult. I thought it was the most difficult job <laughs> uh, in British politics. But in actual fact, I think it's also one of the most important jobs uh, in British politics because I honestly think if we are going to uh, change our country, if we are going to keep the UK together, um, if we are going to have a Labour government across the UK again, then what happens in Scotland is, is so important to that. So um, I, I want to help uh, in that process so we can have a Labour government in Scotland, but also a Labour government across the UK. Um, I'm not pretending that's an easy job. Um, it doesn't usually come with a very long life expectancy, but I'm hoping to turn the tide uh, on that uh, and take the party on a journey over the coming years and hopefully get us back to where we need to be so we can give the people of Scotland, to be frank, the Labour Party they deserve. Scotland always used to be a bit of a fiefdom for the Labour Party. You must have done a lot of soul-searching over the last, what, eight, ten years as, as to why there's been such a decline in the Labour vote, Labour seats in Westminster, Labour seats in, in the Scottish Parliament. W why do you think that has happened? How long have you got, Ian? Um, I, think <laughs> I think we've only got till, I think we've only got till late o'clock, but I'll, I'll try and summarise it for you as, as best I can in, in a few sentences. Um, look, we, we created the Scottish Parliament. Um, we were the proud champions of devolution, but I don't think we actually devolved ourselves in the process or came to terms with devolution. I think that was a big challenge. Um, we obviously had the, the tail end of a UK Labour government, and I think that in itself had some negative impacts on, on a Labour government in Scotland and, and the mood for Labour in Scotland. Um, we then obviously had the referendum in 2014, um, so partly the referendum, but also a big part of the aftermath of the referendum I think was really difficult um, for Labour, not comfortable around identity politics, for example, um, not comfortable around the, the, the hard binary choice of yes versus no. Um, layered on top of that, a Brexit referendum, uh, and then we had a period where we just looked like we were talking to ourselves, looking inward, talking about our history, not focusing on the future. So we've had 20 years of a decline um, of the Labour Party in Scotland, my job is to try and halt the decline and reverse it and get the Labour Party back in the pitch. Um, you might find this an odd analogy, but do, do you think that you are the Ruth Davidson of the Scottish Labour Party? Because the Tories have been in deep decline for effectively decades, and she almost single-handedly rescued the Conservative Party in Scotland to the point where they've overtaken you, they are the opposition now. Um, do you look at her leadership and think, well, I can learn something from that? Well, look, I, I, I know Ruth. I, I like her. I'm, I'm proud to call her someone I'm a friend with. And I have friends across all different political parties. So um, I want to go one step further, though. I don't want to just take a party from third to second. I want to take the Labour Party from third to first. Um, and I would love to see I'm going to complete that process in 10 weeks from the day I became leader to the day of the election. But I'm also a realist. I think if I said I was going to be First Minister in 10 days' time, um, you might be calling people to come and have a chat with me, Ian, um, after the show. So uh, I want to take us on a journey um, over the next five years so we can get Labour back into government uh, in Scotland and have a Labour First Minister. Um, and, you know, uh, Ruth Davidson's chosen to, to walk away. I, I think if anyone watching closely politics in Scotland will recognise that we don't have the cuddly Tories anymore. Yep, they're back to being the same old Tories. And in some ways, they are the biggest gift to the SNP because the SNP, whenever they have a failure, first of all, they claim to talk about independence. Or if that doesn't work, they point at the Tories and say, well, look, as, lo as long as we're not as bad as that lot, everything's OK. I think we can aspire to something better than that. Um, I think we can. So you no one deserves better than that. We deserve a better government and we deserve a better opposition too. Your, your aim in this election, though, presumably, is to come second. I mean, norm, normally all political leaders uh, want to say that they can win, and sometimes, indeed, they, that they, they can. But you, you're a realist. I mean, you recognise that you can't actually come first in this election, can you? Well, look, when I took over leadership, uh, Ian, eight weeks ago, we were at 14% in the opinion polls. Um, one week before uh, that, the Greens were making public statements saying that they were going to push Labour into fourth place. Um, in Scottish politics, never mind Labour battling for third or second place. Um, so we, I've got to take that, and I'm honest about it. Um, I'm being honest that I'm, I'm taking the Labour Party on a journey. 
we were on 14%. I think we've got us back on the pitch. I think we are have a message that is resonating with people across Scotland. And I say directly to people, the process of change in the Labour Party is not complete. I'm not pretending that everything is perfect in the Labour Party again or that we have changed. It is still a process of change. But I need your help. I need your help to carry on that progress and that journey. And if you like what I'm saying, if you agree with me, if you want us to do a different kind of politics, if you want us to focus on what unites us, not what divides us, and not go back to those old arguments, use your votes for Labour on the 6th of May, and let's carry on that process of, of one, giving the people of Scotland the Labour Party they deserve, but more importantly, let's rebuild the country we all love. A, a friend of mine in Scotland um, says that he thinks you're too nice to be a party leader. He doesn't think you've got the ice in your soul that sometimes <laughs> political party leaders lead. You, you aren't as ruthless as you need to be. Um, I mean, you've come across in this interview so far, we've only been talking for six minutes, and I'm thinking, well, you seem a really nice guy. Nice guys often don't come first, though, do they, in the end? Well, well, look, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to break that mold. I, I think one, you can be nice. I, I can disagree with people. Doesn't mean I need to dislike them. Um, I think for far too long, our politics, particularly in the last decade, has felt like we've got to shout at each other and we've got to attack each other in order to get to get ahead. Um, am I tough enough? Look, I have uh, lived the last ten years in frontline politics, Scottish Labour politics, and Scottish politics, which which can be very tough, can't can it? I've, I've been, and ruthless. I, and if I can survive that and keep a good humour. And a good nature through that, uh, I think that tells you something, Ian. Uh, well, well, it does. I've been listening to Tom Harris's Imposter podcast. I don't know if you've had a listen to that. I'm um, not a chance his to really call him today, though. In which, well, I'll tell you what. Very, in, which, in which he very kindly called me handsome, so I better, I better, send, I better send him a thank you. I'm not commenting on that, but um, <laughs> the, 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 vi the visceral nature of Scottish Labour politics... It, it, it's very different from. I mean, you were an MP for five years. You you, you will have seen th how things how operate in yep. the Labour Party in Westminster. But it is very very uh, visceral, isn't it? Look, look absolutely. Look, um, I've I've said this on on the record during the last uh, leadership election. Um, it's felt like the Labour Party in Scotland was playing the Hunger Games, where we were eating ourselves alive until one last person survives and they turn the light out on the way out. And and so to anyone that questions whether I'm too nice or not strong enough or not ruthless enough. If you can survive the Hunger Games, um, you are doing must, must be doing not too bad, particularly the way the Scottish politics has been in the last 10 years. But the serious point, Ian, I'd make is this, is we, we've got to change our... I think COVID has done this, actually, but I think we're behind. When I say we, I mean the political bubble more widely. COVID has changed the world. It's changed Scotland. And the idea that we are our politics doesn't have to change is simply not true. And you can look at the other side of the Atlantic, where nobody thought you could defeat the politics of division with a message of empathy, unity and hope. I think we can defeat the politics of division in the UK. I think we can defeat the politics of division in Scotland. And I'm going to do it with empathy, unity and hope. And I ask people to go on that journey with me. Um, obviously, the, this election is, is sort of almost a schizophrenic election where part of it just seems to be all about independence. And you've been actually trying to get it on to policy areas, which if I was advising either the Conservative Party or the Labour Party in Scotland, I would say don't even mention independence. You'll play the SNP's game for them. Um, get it onto their record. That's what you need to do, because uh, in many policy areas, that they've got quite a difficult record to defend. Yep, so, so a couple of things on that, Ian. One is, um, I'm very clear about what my position in the Constitution is. I don't support independence. I don't support a referendum. But what I'm not willing to do is only put forward a policy programme that speaks to the half of the country that agrees with me on the Constitution. So we've got a plan uh, for all of Scotland. But there's a reason why both the SNP and indeed the Tories want to talk about a referendum or talk about independence. One, it suits the SNP because they don't need to talk about their failing record, which you've quite rightly uh, spoken about, because what they'll say to people is, whether you think our record has been good, whether you think our record has been bad, if you believe in independence, you need to support us and hold hold your nose and ignore all the bad things, because either the bad things wouldn't happen if we had independence, or at least we're not as bad as the Tories. So don't rock the boat. So that, that's their strategy. They're only speaking to the half of the country that agrees with in the Constitution. And in terms of the Conservatives, they have no positive ideas to offer. They, it suits them almost as much, if not in fact more, than the SNP to talk about division and talk about a referendum, because that's all they're holding on to in order to try and stay second okay. in this contest. That doesn't help anyone. And if we can't, through a pandemic, change our politics in Scotland, then what chance do we have? And that's why I'm making my position on the Constitution very clear. That's not going to stop me reaching out to people and say directly, I don't care. 
if you voted yes, no, leave or remain. I honestly don't care. If you want to change Scotland and you want to rebuild a fairer and more equal country coming through this pandemic, you can vote Labour in this election. Right, we've got much more to talk about, but we have to go to a break now. Anna Sawa, stay there. Uh, we'll come back to you in a second. It's 7.47. 7.51 on LBC. I'm talking to the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Anna Sawa. Um, let, let's just test out, test you out on the referendum a bit, because if the SNP wins with a majority of seats and maybe a majority of the vote, surely they would have a mandate to have a second referendum. Would you still oppose it in, in those circumstances? Well, I, I, you're not going to be surprised with my answer. I, I'm not going to... Um, commentate on the result of the election. I'm a, I'm a participant, not a spectator in the election. Well, you've already admitted that you're not going to come first, so you yeah, kind yes, of admitted but, that they are going to win. No, but the, the the thing about the Scottish Parliament is, and about Holyrood, is it's a parliament that was designed to try and encourage political parties and politicians to work together in the national interest and not to put too much power with one political party. That's the way the system was designed. Now, I accept mm. on one occasion um, the SNP have won a majority. But I actually don't think the SNP will win a majority in this election campaign. And, and what I'm saying directly to people is, if you want a parliament that focuses on you, your family and the national recovery, let's not put too much power into one political party. So let's stop that SNP majority. But let's also have an opposition that's going to take its role seriously in the parliament, not be a game-playing childish opposition that just wants to shout about the constitution, but also pulls the government and pulls the parliament no, towards fair, the fair enough, national fair enough. Fair and, enough. And that's the case I'm making in the last nine days. Sure. Some of your candidates, though, um, initially it was said to be three, it now seems to be more than ten, um, have actually publicly said that they think there should be a second referendum. You've said you don't, and I think the Scottish voters would quite like to know, uh, have a clear lead from you as the leader of Scottish Labour on what your position is on a second referendum. Yep, so let me say it absolutely bluntly and clearly, and it says this in our manifesto as well, we do not support independence, we do not support a referendum, and we want the next five years of the parliament to be a national recovery parliament, not going back to the old arguments, the old divisions. And we so why do some of your candidates say they do want a referendum? Uh, look, that, that was, look, I think it's important to say that all of our candidates are unified around our manifesto. And I think it's, it's around people giving commentary about what would happen in the event of certain results in an election campaign. I wasn't willing to do that during the leadership election and I'm not willing to do it around this election as well. I'm not a commentator, I'm a participant in this election campaign and I want to try and persuade people across Scotland that we can choose something different. We can actively choose to come through this pandemic and not go back to those old arguments and instead focus on what unites us. Um, you've criticised Jeremy Corbyn in the past, but you said your economic plans would be even more progressive and radical of those of Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. Give me one example of that where you would be more radical than them. So we have the most ambitious and boldest job creation scheme in the history of the Scottish Parliament, 1.2 billion. We want to introduce a new tax in Scotland, uh, which would hit the online retailers the hardest. So we want to have a new tax in Scotland where we tax Amazon. Uh, and we use that money to invest in high streets across but the country. But you haven't got the power to do that. We absolutely have the power to do that. We have the we have the we actually we actually have the power to do that. So we, we would immediately set up a, a a working group to look at how we use our local taxation powers in order to impose a tax on online giants like Amazon around their factories. You, you can't and you, use you that don't money have. Correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, you don't have local taxation powers that would enable you to raise taxes have, on Amazon. Yes, that has to come through the Westminster Parliament. No, we, we absolutely have the powers to do it. Under what? Uh, from the existing powers of the Parliament. So, for example, if you look at the powers we have around around rates, uh, when we, for example, when we had the uh, social responsibility levy policy, we could, we could use our local taxation powers to put a certain tax on, for example, uh, properties that were a certain size or buildings oh, that right. were a certain okay. size. Okay, no, I, I get that you can do that on rates, but you, 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 can't, you, can't, you, use, you can't, can't levy a charge on each purchase, though, that sort of thing, can you? No, not on each purchase, no. So, so, no. so we're not suggesting we could, le we could levy a charge on each purchase, but what we could do is levy a charge on certain types of units, online retailers and the factories, so we can raise an Am Amazon tax, directly an Amazon tax, and use that money to invest in the high street. So, so we're not for a second suggesting we're going to take that money and then put it somewhere else. What I'm saying to you directly is high streets are suffering as a result of the pandemic. They were struggling pre-pandemic, and the, and the behaviour change that's as a result of the pandemic with more and more people using online means that even when the lockdown fully ends and we get through the virus, people will still be tempted to use largely online retailers rather than going to the high street. So I want to tax the online retailers who aren't paying a fair share of their profits, tax them and instead put the money into the high street so we can uh, save high streets across the country and create jobs. 
I, I was reading an article about you at the weekend where you described yourself as a hypocrite. Why did you do that? <laughs> well, I, I actually didn't. I think that was that was words used by, by other people, by a certain journalist in, in particular. Um, so that's not a new word I use for myself. And as I said at the time, I've been called a lot worse than that, Ian. All right. Well, the reason was that you send your kids to a fee-paying school, which for a Labour politician, a Labour leader, um, I mean, normally you wouldn't get elected having pe with people knowing that you, you had done that. But you've been open about it. How can you possibly justify it? Well, look, what I say to people, it's a fair question and it's a fair criticism. And it's a decision that my wife and I took what we thought was in the best interest of our children. And every single day there are people across the country who are making decisions that they think are in the best interest of their children. But the reality is there are too many children across our country that don't get a first chance, never mind a second chance. And that's why we put an education comeback plan front and centre of our election campaign. We want every single people across the country to get an individual assessment, not just of their educational attainment, but also their mental health. To back that up with one-on-one -on -one tutoring for the children that need that extra support. We want a reset guarantee uh, for those young people who are sitting their exams this year or last year or would have been sitting their exams, didn't get the qualifications they were hoping for and therefore perhaps didn't get the access to a university place or the job they were looking forward to. We don't want a lost generation coming through the pandemic, so we want to give them a free guaranteed uh, reset. And we also want a summer comeback pass so we can use the opportunity of the lockdown ending and the summer months to allow young people to get free access to sport, free access to cultural venues, give money to local organisations so they can rekindle those friendships, get their mental health and well-being back on track and be raring to go when the schools go back after the summer holidays. Anna Sabah, thank you very much for joining us. And as I say, we will be speaking to the Scottish uh, National Party and the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats uh, tomorrow, actually. Yeah.